Revelation 10 to 11, page 1095. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun, his legs were like fiery pillars, and he had a little scroll opened in his hand. He put his right foot on the sea, his left on the land, and he cried out with a loud voice like a roaring lion. When he cried out, the seven thunders spoke with their voices, and when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders said, and do not write it down. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. He swore an oath by the one who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, the sea and what is in it. There will no longer be an interval of time, but in the days of the sound of the seventh angel, when he will blow his trumpet, then God's hidden plan will be completed, as he announced to his servants the prophets. Now the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take and eat it. It will be bitter in your stomach, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I ate it, My stomach became bitter, and I was told, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Then I was given a measuring reed like a rod with these words, Go and measure God's sanctuary and the altar and count those who worship there, but exclude the courtyard outside the sanctuary. Don't measure it, because it is given to the nations, and they'll trample the holy city for 42 months. I'll empower my two witnesses and they'll prophesy for 1,260 days, dressed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These men have the power to close the sky so that it does not rain during the days of their prophecy. They also have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with any plague whenever they want. When they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them, conquer them and kill them. Their dead bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is called, prophetically, Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And representatives from the peoples, tribes, languages and nations will view their bodies for three and a half days and not permit their bodies to be put into a tomb. Those who live on the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. So great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. At that moment, a violent earthquake took place. A tenth of the city fell and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe was passed. Take note, the third woe is coming quickly. The seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah and he'll reign forever and ever. The 24 elders who were seated before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God saying, we thank you Lord God, the Almighty who is and who was because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry but your wrath has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints and to those who fear your name, both small and great. And the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. God's sanctuary in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant appeared in his sanctuary. There were lightnings, rumblings, thunders, an earthquake 
and severe hail. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> Be to God. Now, I don't know uh, how you're going post-Olympics, uh, but I often have a little bit of a downer after that uh, gorging on world sport. Uh, it reminds me of often when my younger days, when I used to do a race, I'd devote a long time to a race, I'd train, I'd be disciplined, and then the six to eight weeks afterwards was always very difficult. I just didn't feel like I had a structure or a purpose. I was reading an article uh, about athletes after the Tokyo Olympics, and one athlete described it like this. Ordinary life is a lot different than viewing the world from the lofty vantage point of Mount Olympus. When you have become a god, when you have devoted every fibre of your being to becoming a god, when you have competed on Mount Olympus and you still have 40 or 50 years left to live, when your identity is inseparable from your sport, then the end of the Olympics can expose how many levels of frustration and disappointment you've got. The God you are devoted to and the God you have become is suddenly seen as empty, frail and broken. And that can apply to the forever house you want to build, the career you want to construct, the investment portfolio you have curated, the experiences you accumulate, the family you have put on a pedestal, the lifestyle you have accumulated, and the image you project. All the idols we're devoted to. The seals are off the scroll. God's promises and plans are being implemented. And last week, the general picture is clear. God will judge human sin by handing humans over to their sin. And now in the second cycle of seven, we see God judge a particular aspect of that, and it's called idolatry. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word, which seems a funny thing to pray, Father, after such a scary passage. Uh, We've read four chapters that are immensely dense, but you say they're clear. And so we pray that you'll give us clarity through these words. Uh, We pray that people will hear your words speak today, Father, by your spirit. We pray that you'll confront and comfort us. We pray that you'll equip us to be faithful witnesses. In Jesus' name, amen. At point two on the outline, Revelation is a clarifying word from God. Uh, It's about the faithful witness, his name is Jesus, written by a faithful witness, his name is John, to God's mob so that they can be a faithful witness about Jesus, that Jesus lived, died and rose, so sin and death is beaten, and that he is already on the throne in heaven. Uh, John seated on a piece of rock in the Mediterranean called Patmos because he has been a faithful witness. And he continually drives home this truth, Jesus wins. Jesus has already beaten sin and death. Jesus is historically victorious because he lived, died and rose for the sins in the world and saved his people. So he's gathered his mob, chapters 2 and 3, and he's talked to his mob and he's confronted and comforted them. Uh, As he's done this, he's established as worthy. Remember Revelation 4 to 5, look at the pictures out the front. He's worthy to open the scroll of God's plan to reverse the curse of sin. Remember that lamb that walked into the throne room of God dripping blood everywhere? And as he opens the scroll and peels off these seven seals, Revelation 6 to 7, John shows the first step in God's plan is the dealing with human sin, the big picture as God hands them over to sin. And as all this takes place, what does God say again and again? My mob will be, they'll be safe. They're mine, none will be lost. So as we turn to this section, I'm going to cover a large chunk. Let me just remind you of a couple of really important things. A revelation is what we call an apocalypse. In fact, there's an equal sign there. That's what the word revelation means, apocalypse. Uh, It means clear word from God, which you're kind of scratching your heads like I did during the week. How is this clear? 
But it also operates with certain certain literary forms. Uh, All apocalypse in the Bible uses pictures and images and vibrant colours and numbers. Uh, In fact, nothing we read in Revelation is new. You want to look at locusts? Go and read Joel. You want to see a temple being measured? Go and look at Zechariah. You want to see things held from heaven unto earth? Go and read Exodus. It's all, all, all what God's already done. And so as we deal with these things, remember what God is doing with all of this imagery is he's not talking about quantities, he's talking about qualities. Uh, Number seven, uh, that's complete. Ten and multiples of ten, that's a really long time. Half, ten or multiples of ten, that's not a long time. Uh, Half of seven, that's incomplete. Twelve or multiples of twelve, that's people of God. So we're talking qualities, not quantities. Uh, As an apocalypse, revelation can be best grasped by stepping backwards and looking at things from a long way away. Oh, what what piece of art is that from? If I step back, what piece of art is that? It's called Blue Pulse, Jackson Pollock, National Gallery. You don't look at Blue Pulse by standing 30 centimetres away. You don't get the scale of it, the purpose of it, what's going on. If you want to look at blue poles, you step back and you see the whole picture. That's what we're doing with Revelation. We're stepping back and we're looking at the big picture, which means a lot of the small details, why do the locusts wear gold crowns, we're not going to deal with today. That's why we do Bible study groups. That's the pleasure of gathering for an hour and a half, two hours each week with a small group of people pulling this apart. Uh, The section of Revelation that we're looking at now from Revelation 6 through to Revelation 17 is often misunderstood. Uh, A lot of people view this as a timeline. So what God is saying here are consecutive events which if we map it out, we'll know when that seventh trumpet's going to sound. The problem is God actually makes clear that's not what he's doing. In Mark 13, no one will know the day. And so what we're dealing with here is a series of visions about the same period of time from different angles. Remember that image last week of the overhead projector and how we lay the sheets on top of each other and it builds the picture up? It's the same space. It's just getting more and more angles on it. And as we go through it, it gets more and more intense. So we're looking at the same period of time as we looked at last week between Jesus' first coming and his second coming, just from a different angle. And in this, in this period from Revelation 6 to 17, the period from Jesus' first coming to his second coming, we have four cycles of seven, and they all work the same. You have four, which kind of apply to the world here today, the concrete world we live in. Then you have five and six, which kind of step back and pull the curtain back, a bit behind the scenes look. Then you have a break called an interlude, and usually in that break the question is, what's, what are God's mob doing at this time? And then we have the last one which moves into the next cycle. Four lots of seven. Four, two, break, number seven, next cycle. Okay? All layered on top of each other. So point three, chapter eight, verse one, the seventh seal is opened. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. That's the right response to God, isn't it? Silence. When you actually realise that God's plan is now fully open and the seventh seal is a fast forward and you actually see that God's done exactly as he promised, how should you respond to God? Not with the chatter that we often bring, but with silence. Seven angels are gathered. They receive seven trumpets. Please notice right throughout this that only God authorises and empowers behaviour, even for the angels. Another angel appears. He has incense. He also has the prayers of the people of God. The two are mixed, they're offered to God. Then the incense burner is taken, thrown to the earth, immediate impact, and seven trumpets are about to sound. Have you ever viewed prayer that way? Have you ever viewed prayer as being presented before God, all the prayers of God's people, 
and God responds? Do you, do you realize that's what prayer is and how powerful it is? The seven seals have been opened, God's mob pray, and God acts. How powerful is prayer? Because of the God who listens. And the trumpets start to sound at point four on the outline. Are the first four trumpets, like the first four seals, all describe an action initiated by God on and in this world. Trumpet one in chapter eight, verse seven, hurls hail, fire, and blood to the earth. Physical creation is affected. And notice last week it was always quarters. This week it's thirds. It's more intense, isn't it? As we get a fuller picture. Trumpet two sounds, chapter eight, eight to nine. Something like a great mountain is hurled into the sea. All the oceans are affected. Trumpet three. Chapter 8, verses 10 to 11, a great star falls into the fresh waters. All the fresh waters are turned bitter. Trumpet 4 in 8, 12, the firmament is damaged. Stars and moon and sun all darkened. And at that point, as that damage to creation is seen, what flies across? Chapter 8, verse 13, an eagle. Do you notice what the eagle cries out? Always pay attention when a word's repeated three times in the Bible. Woe, woe, woe. It's an image of chaos and decreation, isn't it? Uh, It's an image of as God's mob pray and God responds, the very fibre of the created world is judged. And we see how intense it is and we see how widespread it is. Every part of creation is affected. And the language should recall for us another moment in God's creation when God acted, when God judged creation, when God decreated, when God confronted humans with the things they were devoted to. Can you remember that? when God saved his people out of Egypt with great plagues in the book of Exodus. The plagues are echoed here, aren't they? And if you cast your mind back to Exodus, God confronted the idolatry of the Egyptians. We'll get to that word in a moment. At that moment, God revealed how powerless the Egyptian gods and the Egyptian devotion was. At that moment, God displayed his own power. At that moment, God rip the clothes off the things humans were devoted to. You see, that's what idolatry is. Idolatry is not something sitting on your mantelpiece. It's giving something else the devotion God deserves. It's giving something else the devotion God deserves. And God judges that amongst the people who bear his image. And as God does that, he reveals himself, doesn't he? It's striking that God brings that judgment on the physical world. On the physical world. As humans devote themselves to their careers, to their investment portfolios, to their small business enterprises, to building their own little empires, as humans are devoted to their own appetites and lusts, to their own families and to their experiences. As humans run around not wishing to miss any opportunity, as they pursue the idol of sport and leisure, God asks, who are you devoted to? Idolatry is where good things become God things. Idolatry is where good things become God things. And it's not tame and it's not harmless. And when the fifth and the sixth trumpets sound, we have clarity. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. The fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. The key to the shaft of the abyss was given to him. He opened the shaft of the abyss and smoke came up out of the shaft like smoke from a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the shaft. Then out of the smoke, locusts came to the earth. Power was given to them like the power that scorpions have on earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, 
but only people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. They were not permitted to kill them, but were to torment them for five months. And their torment is like the torment caused by a scorpion when it strikes a man. How do these locusts get out? God allows them. God empowers them. God permits them. God sends one of his messengers and the messenger lets loose the judgment of God. We've kind of been taken behind the scenes here so that we see what's going on with idolatry. And this judgment is let loose so that we see what's behind idolatry. What's behind idolatry? Well, we see what's behind idolatry there in 9-11. We see that behind idolatry is destruction. Now, that's the name given to the ruler of these locusts in this really vibrant image. Abaddon, Apollyon, destroyer. The power behind idolatry is the power that wants to destroy what God has made by directing people's devotion away from God and to, to other things. And we have another name for that power, don't we? His name will be revealed next week in Revelation 12. And God's judgment is simply very similar to how God judged with the seals. He hands people over to their idolatry so that they can see when good things become God things, it leads only to torment and pain and futility. And if you seriously consider that in the world, you will realise it's truth. That forever house, does it lead to peaceful rest and contentment or worry about interest rates, insurance and upgrades? The career that has been carefully constructed with wise choices, has it led to rest, delight and satisfaction or concern about the next step and sleepless nights because others are just behind you? The family that we worship and the opportunities that we must not miss, has that led to rest and fulfilment or fear that we might have missed something? Or perhaps the family hasn't measured up to what we wanted. That sporting success or investment portfolio or experience that is pursued or educational qualification, has that led to contentment and fulfilment? Or fear about your hamstrings and world economic crises and a search for the great next high? When good things, and hear me correctly, I'm not saying they're not good, but when good things become God things, as devotion that God deserves is misdirected, what emerges? Idolatry is not tame. Idolatry is not harmless. Idolatry is not the pursuit of your dreams or enjoying every opportunity or living authentically. Idolatry is destruction. Taking the good things making them God things, and it's judged by God. And when we come to the sixth trumpet, it leads to emptiness, death, and torment. God's very clear why he's doing it. Look at chapter 9, verse 20. The rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands to stop worshipping demons and idols of God, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which are not able to see, hear, or walk, and they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality or their thefts. Why does God do this? He wants people to come back. He wants people to repent. He wants people to come to him who has made them and be restored because of what Jesus has done. And what do humans do? We refuse. At this point, we need a break, don't we? That's why we get an interlude. <laughs> Now, that's why we have a moment where we pause and we've gone the first six trumpets, four and two, and now we have an interlude. I'm at point five on the outline. Uh, and the obvious question at this point, like the interlude at the end of the fifth and the sixth trumpets uh, seals last time, the, the question is, where do God's mob fit in all this? Where do God's mob fit in all this? Now, we know they're protected, don't we? Chapter 9, verse 4. We know that those who are faithful witnesses who trust in Jesus are protected temporally. 
We know that God's in control, but where do God's mob fit in all this? Uh, I think that's the question God's dealing with next as he talks to John, because John then looks and sees another mighty angel uh, start of chapter 10, and the mighty angel there at start of chapter 10 is described in a very similar way to God. Could be God. Striking figure. Stands in such a way to dominate the whole known world and holds a small scroll, just a portion of the big scroll that we're seeing unfold. And that angel reassures John. Hey, John, there are things that only God will know. Don't write that down. There are th- things that only God will know. But you'll know this very clearly, John, verse 6. There will no longer be an interval of time But in the days of the sound of the seventh angel, when he will blow his trumpet, then God's mystery, his hidden plan, will be finalised as he announced to his servants the prophets. Uh, John, there is stuff that you're not going to know, but know this, God's plan will finish. And the mystery, well, if you know your Bible, same language that Paul uses all the time, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. The angel reassures John. Then he instructs John and he enables him. John said, uh, John's command, it's time to eat, John. So John goes up to this mighty angel and the angel says, eat this scroll. I'm going to tell you what this meal will be like. It'll be sweet and bitter. And once you've eaten it, then open your mouth, chapter 10, verse 11, and start prophesying. So John eats the little bit of scroll and it is sweet, like God's word always is, Psalm 19. Sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. Then he starts to proclaim, and it's bitter in his belly. Sweetness and bitterness. Now that's the purpose of God's mob. Just look at John as he receives these words. John has swallowed the word of God, and it was sweet, and he proclaimed it, and it was bitter, and now he's perched on a rock in the Mediterranean. That's bitter, isn't it? 40 or 50 years on your own, no family, no friends, no community. That's bitter. But just so the rest of God's people understand what's going on, John then sees a worked example of the bitterness, doesn't he? And that's what happens in the rest of chapter 10 and 11. Uh, God hands the world over to this judgment with idolatry, but then he makes sure John measures out and sees that God's mob are okay. That's the image with the temple being measured. Uh, The world may trample, trample, and God says it's okay, off you go, trample and trample and trample. God's mob are safe for that time. It seems a long time, but it's limited. And as the world tramples and God's mob are protected, there are witnesses, two witnesses, imagery just like applied to God's people earlier on. Those two witnesses go out and proclaim about God in the same time. As those two witnesses proclaim looking like God's people, what happens to them? Did you see that? The beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them, conquer them and kill them. The witnesses to God will be slaughtered by a world under judgment in torment and it will happen in every place, even in the city where they killed Jesus. That's bitter, isn't it? And the world gloats. The world sends presents to each other, little snapshots on Instagram of what they did to Christians. And then what happens? <laughs> like a moment out of Genesis 1 and 2, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. They'll be resurrected. They'll be called up to dwell with God. It's not a surprising pattern. What happened to Jesus? <laughs> if they had Instagram then, can you imagine the photos of the cross? Can you imagine the horror of the empty tomb as they realised that he'd walked out? And some will respond. Chapter 11, verse 13. There's the bitterness and the sweetness. What are God's mob going to do? They're going to witness with a bittersweet word. And they'll follow in the footsteps of their Lord and Saviour. And through that, some will come back to God. The last trumpet sounds, point six on the outline. We flashed forward like every last one does, flash forward to the vast future, and we see that what that mighty angel said at the start of the interlude, that promise 
that everything will come to fruition does. Look there at 11.16. The 24 elders who were seated before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We thank you, Lord God, the Almighty who is and who was, because you've taken your great power and have begun to reign. Do you notice what's missing there in the description of God? He's not coming. He is. It's no longer the fact that God was and is and is coming. It's God was and is. He is triumphant because Jesus has beaten sin and death and they rule together with the gods of the world exposed as empty. I think looking at blue poles is much simpler, isn't it? God gave revelation for clarity. It's about a faithful witness called Jesus, written by a faithful witness called John, so that God's mob could be a faithful witness to Jesus. And so every time we look at a part of Revelation, we've got to ask ourselves, how does this equip me to be a faithful witness? At the last point on the outline. There is clarity here about God. The world looks chaotic. We said this last week. The world looks like it's careering towards doom and disaster, but this much is clear. God is judging it. The chaos that we think is uncontrollable is actually the judgment of God. And he's in charge of it all. And just like you would expect of God, he judges evil, injustice and emptiness. And his mob are safe. Please be clear about who God is, about what God is doing. He is not distant from this world or his mind. What what are presented before God? All the prayers we'll pray next Sunday when we gather for parish prayer. The prayer that Jess will bring us later on this service. The prayers you're praying now. The prayer that Seamus will bring. God is not distant or out of control. There's clarity about the world, isn't there? Clarity about the world under judgment in the very fibre of creation. It shouldn't surprise us as we are devoted to good things which God has made. The God thing exposes them and says, why do you worship them and not me? The reality of the world's idolatry or what it truly is, a thing that destroys and never creates, uh, that reality should not be avoided. We've we've got to be clear about that. When good things become God things, it destroys. There's clarity here about God's purpose. God is not vindictive or vicious. He wants people to come back. He wants people to return to him. But there is great sadness here, isn't there, for us as we watch a world refusing to return? a great desire as we want people to come back. It's not fatalism, but it's a spur to be clear about God in the world, to the world. And what's the job of God's people? Have you ever thought that your job is to change the world by presenting your prayers to God? Have you ever prayed about idolatry? About the way in which... Our devotions are misdirected. There's much here to apply to us, isn't there? God's mob must be a witness. Do we swallow that sweet word of God? Do we proclaim it? Do we feel its bitterness as the world lashes out? No, it's merely just following Jesus. It's done confidently, knowing we're safe. It's done calmly knowing the reaction we will receive. And it's done with great rejoicing because it's such a significant and world-changing role, isn't it, to be a faithful witness, to proclaim with clarity. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. We've covered a huge amount, Father, this morning. But really it is this simple. You are judging the world for its misdirected devotion. You are calling the world back to you. You make this possible because of Jesus. And our job as your people is to be a faithful witness, swallowing a sweet word that will bring bitterness, but will bring restoration by you.
Father, help us to rejoice in this. Help us to know that this is following in the footsteps of Jesus. And Father, through this, do as you say and bring others to know and love you. In Jesus' name, amen.